All right, I'm going to start back up. This is based off of the one that's in the book, so I'd like to go through it. It may take two days to get through this lecture, all right? But I'd rather take, you know, do it slow and sure and have you hopefully at least understand it as well as you possibly can. That's more important to me. So, This is, again, this is the try it out or whatever the, she calls it, that you do it. So notice what it says. In this section, you create a student class and you instantiate or create objects based off of that class. The class has an ID number, a last name, and a grade point average. That's all it has, okay? So I started the new project and literally, she, she does this ask backwards, just so you know. She has you build the class file first before you even have a main. So if you look up on the screen here, let, let's say that I start up, now I've got four versions of Visual Studio running right now. That's fine. So if I come through here and let's say that I start up a brand new console project, and that's called Create Students, just so there's no confus confusion, rather, I'm just going to call this Students. All right? But you get this automatically, you get a main. You know this already. That, that shouldn't be a surprise to any of you. They're, the main's not going to do a darn thing right now because there's nothing in it, but there's a main. What I'm telling you is if you look up on the screen right here, this is what you have to do from now on in these two chapters. You have to right mouse click, on the, not on your solution, but on the name of your project, which is students, and you have to choose add, new item, and I believe it's right near the top. There it is, class. You don't want the one that says component class. No. That's going to be if you're building your own controls. You're not doing that in here. All right? So you'd asked Colin before about, like, progress markers and stuff. If you want to build your own, you could do that in here. All right? But we're going into class, and then we come in here. For example, if I write students, students, then notice I get a new file right here. See that? called students.cs and it looks a lot like our main except this, there's no main in it and I can only put code in here. Reason I'm telling you this is when you do your program for your you know your programs in class for your assignments and you do your test you're going to have to do this. <clears throat> and I don't want anybody to say well you never showed us how to do it. Yes I did. So, they have you create this class, okay, that they call student, and again, a student has an ID number, a last name, and a grade point average. That's all they have. Everybody cool with that? Makes sense? That's all of the data. There are two constants. The highest GPA you can attain is a 4. The lowest is a 0, 0.0. Now, there are in here, I think, three people who got over 100 on the last test. So if we were figuring out their GPA based on that, it would be more than a four. <coughs> this is saying you can't do that. Does that make sense? This is, that, that's your, what's referred to typically, that's the domain for a grade. Greater than or equal, and greater than or equal to 0, 0.0 and less than or equal to 4.0. You did something like that similar on a test not too long ago. All right, then we come in here and we do this. This is where, again, we're setting up our getters and setters. In fact, what the author tells you to do is to do these, and then they come in through here and they say, now all these, everything that's in here in the blue, they tell you to go back and they say, you know what, if you wanted to, you could rewrite that, all that code that you just saw. Where is it? as just these two lines. So it's saying what we did here in one, two, three, four, come on, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 lines of code we could have done in just two lines of code. I don't really care 
if you're not going to change anything, so in other words, if, you, if you're not doing any validation on your set, if you want to write it like this, then just write it like that. Good morning. Just keep going. You're okay. fine. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. You're going to see that out in the real world, so to speak. It'll normally be done like this. If you give a programmer an opportunity to write something in 24 lines of code or to write it in two lines of code, they're going to choose two most of the time because they're the ones who not only have to write it, they're the ones who have to maintain it. All right? And it's doing the exact same thing. So in other words, when the program goes and it actually gets compiled, those 24 lines get converted into these two. All right? But when it goes through the compilation process, it's got to take 24 lines and make it two. So, you know, you're all smart enough to know this. Which one's going to compile faster? The two, correct? Because it's only two lines. Now, you can't do that with this one. Because in the set, you're, you're actually checking something. Does that make sense? Well, all that cleaning I did this morning for that. All right. But you, you, can't, you can't combine, to my knowledge, like I can't do this one with just a get and then put in this one. You see what I'm saying? You've either got to just, if you're doing absolutely no validation, you almost always will write it like this. If you're doing any validation, then you have to write it like this. So what are we doing here? Well, again, this is the way the author did it. I like putting in extra parentheses. Student one day called me the parenthesis fairy. and didn't realize how close I came to smacking him. But uh, what that's doing in there is saying what? Okay, if it's greater than or equal to that, then you set it. Otherwise, you set it to zero, which is kind of cheap because that person who got a 4.1, now their, their GPA was reset to a zero. But you say, well, why didn't you set it to four? We could have, but what if you put a negative number in there? Then it's going to reset the negative number to a four, too. See what I'm saying? All right. Now, what I want to make sure is that you understand what's going on. This is a class. This is a blueprint. This is a self-contained unit, which says every time we create a student, that student will have an ID number, that student will have a last name, that student will have a GPA. The lowest GPA a student can attain is 0, 0.0, and the highest, whoops, and the highest GPA the student can attain is a 4.0, okay? It's the same way it is with you here. And then we basically aren't doing any validation, so whatever we pass in as a name, or I'm sorry, as an ID number and as a last name, we're just taking it. Even if we put in something that was out of whack, we really should check, and you know how to do this now, you really should check, for example, in here, we should check to make sure that at least that's a number, shouldn't we? I mean, that would be a good thing to do. And again, you all know how to do that. Even the person who didn't take their test knows how to do that. All right? We use the tri-parse or, or something similar to that. What you'll notice when we get to Chapter 11 is you put it in a tri-block. And if the tri-block fails, then you catch it and you handle it that way. That's what we're going to get to in Chapter 11. So... Again, we're doing all that. So that basically is saying, as of right now, all right, a student has these three properties, fields, attributes, whatever you want to call them. Each one of these attributes, fields, properties has their own get and set, okay, regardless of how you write it. We need this because this, is our, this establishes our domain for our GPA, all right? Now, I changed it around from what's in the book, okay? Why? Because the author wrote it, wrote it in an asinine way, okay? Now, if Joyce Farrell walks in here right now and hits me for saying that, okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll apologize to her. What I mean is this. She takes this routine and she writes it inside of main. There's absolutely no reason to do that. So instead of putting it in a main, I took a routine called display, put it right in the class itself. So you say, well, why'd you do that? Because 
you want the class to be a self-contained unit. It's, it's, the, uh, it's everything the object can do. It's its data and it's its methods. Okay? So now if I go back to main, what are we doing in main? Well, if I said to you right now, what is this doing? And if you said that's instantiating two student objects, you'd be correct. Does that make sense to everyone? Because it's the name of the class followed by the name of your object equals new followed by the name of the class. We haven't even gotten to constructors yet. Okay? Because all that information that they put in here, just so you see this, okay, if we set up a constructor to handle an ID number and a last name and a grade point average, then instead of writing it like this, this is what we're going to get to in just a little bit. So I'm going to put this in here, but I'm going to comment it out <clears throat> because it's going to fail otherwise. So we'll be able to write it, instead of writing it like this, we'll write it like this. We'll say student first equals new student, and we'll put in here one, two, three, comma, Anderson, and 3.5. So we'll provide that information as soon as we create the object. That's what you do with, that's one thing you can do with a constructor. Since we haven't written a constructor yet, we can't provide any information. So if you said, well, what about the second one? Well, you should know that by now. That's going to be what? 789, oops, I don't know what I did there. 789, followed by Daniels, followed by 4.1. Does all that make sense? That's what we're going to get to in just a minute. All right? So what this says is, okay, now I've created these two objects. Now that I've created them, one called first and one called second, now I can set the ID numbers here, here, and here, or the ID and the last name and the grade point for the first one, and the ID number, the name, and the grade point for the second one. Then we just tell it to display. All right. Now, mine looks a little funky because in my display I put a read line in there because otherwise it blew up when I got done. Okay, so when I run this, it looks like this. One, two, three, Anderson, 3.5. 79 Daniels, they put in a 4.1. Remember that's out of range. Since it was out of range, we reset it to 0, .0. <clears> 0. <throat> so if you run yours, this should work. All right. This gives you a baseline to at least start when you're doing this stuff. What I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, I think I know what I'm gonna do already, but what, I, what I'm going to do is when I go home tonight, I'm gonna take a look at the problems at the end of the chapter. There's two or three problems at the end of the chapter where they break it into like four parts. What I'm looking at doing right now is doing the first two parts with you on those two problems and assigning the other two parts for you to do. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, now let's take a look. There are no arrays in here. Okay. Okay. I don't know why you know this minus ten, etc. I I think what they're doing is they're they're setting it up so that it's formatted on the line. All right. Why did they do it like that? I don't have a clue. But we should be able to just stay, say in here this. Zero, one, two. All right. And I'll just put in two blank spaces in between each one, for example. All right. Now when I come back here and I run this, okay, did you notice at first, when the first time I ran it, it was actually pushed over a little bit from the edge? It's not now. See? I don't know why she did that. Maybe because earlier in the book she did talk about that you can put in delimiters in here as far as setting that stuff up. Why you'd want to bring that up now and do that is way beyond my ability to comprehend. All right? But if you think, well, at least I sort of get what you're doing, that's where you should be. Those of you who struggle with this stuff, you have to read the book. All right? And that's why I went over this example. And I even modified it a little bit, as I just mentioned to you. All right? 
So what they tell you to do in the book is that they say, go through this. We just did. And then go through your main. We just did. And then they say, hey, remember, after you print all that stuff out, that you can go back and you can change the ID number and the last number. And that's what I did, but I, I commented that out. All right. So that gets us here to, what page are we on now? We're on 373. More about public and private access modifiers on 373. All right. It's considered to be okay. Please listen to this. It is considered to be okay to make constants public. Did you hear that? Regular data that changes, all right, that's private. But constants can be public. If you want to make them private, you can. But sometimes they're needed in, in a lot of other places. So typically they are made public. It seems to violate what we talked about. But remember, you're never changing its value. Once we've set this, motto always equals our carpets are quality made. Always. Can't change it. You try to change it when the program's running, you get an error. And that's what they talk about in here. <clears throat> All right. The next thing here on 377 is what's called the this reference. This Again, no pun intended, this, this is on your test. You'll have to know what the this reference is. The reason that you use the word this is twofold, and I'll show you one of them, and then I'll show you the other one. But this, the word this, in the context we're seeing here, means the current object. That's what it means. All right? So rather than you having to always write down the name of the object dot something, you can say this dot something. Now when you look at the example that's here, and you might say, we didn't have to say this. We could just say return title, title equals, etc. But now a lot of, in a lot of programming languages, all right, programmers put the word this all over the place. So you're, you're specifying that I mean the current object. What I'm showing you right now, that will also work in Java. Again, you don't do it exactly the same way with your gets and sets, but you use the this modifier in Java. All right? So for now, just remember that that's what they're talking about, okay? They go through it, and it's not a bad example in here. There's just not enough time to do it. Um, but they've got this book example that they create. It's kind of a running example that goes through most of the chapter. It might be with, you know, again, worth your while if you're not understanding this, all the stuff that's in here to go and, and, and key it in. But I like the way she puts pictures and stuff in here. The other, the other time you use this doesn't make sense in this context. It makes sense in Java, but not in this language because it's done differently here. But notice this. The field price is this dot price within the method. All right? What's going to happen is, depending on how you write this, okay, please look, because this, this, this is the example I wanted to show you. All right? See how it's called price? Actual parameter name? But if you use it in a method, you say, oh, it's a formal parameter name. Right? You can't do that with object-oriented. If I were to say in here, just price equal price, if I had done it like that, the system doesn't know that that price and that price, they're not the same thing. They normally are in the non-object-oriented stuff we've done, but in the object-oriented, they're not the same thing. Here you have to say this.price, because that means the price that's here is that one. The price that's here because it's got a this dot is that one. So if, if, you're, using, if, you, if you're using the same name for a formal and an actual parameter, you have to use the word this. So you say, what if I just called it P? Then you could just say price equal P. That's totally fine to do that. You still, the word this would still work there. But what I'm telling you, because this is different than what we looked at in non-object oriented stuff. All right, because a lot of you would ask that. Well, when we, when we write, when we, uh, write a, a function or a method or whatever, why don't we just give it the same formal parameter name as the actual? And I said, you could. Here, if you do, if you're assigning it, 
to the actual inst what's called an instance variable right here, you must use the word this with a dot. You have to do that. Where? That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, you're going to get an error. You're going to get an error if you run that. I don't have a clue. I would just cross one of them out in your book. All right. You should. Yeah, you should get an error because you're defining it twice. I never even noticed that. So how do we know what you're talking? It uh, it's contextual. So it always takes it in terms of the current object that you're working with. In this case, it knows that you're working with a book object. All right? And that's basically, so it, it works its way in and it says, oh, it's a book object, so it must be that price that's right there. I was using book. Yes. And if, if you write really complex programs, you could literally have hundreds of classes in a program. So that's how it knows it works its way out, so it sees the this, and it says, well, oh, there's a this there, or there's, I'm sorry, there's a price there, and that's part of books. So it says, oh, yeah, it must be the book's price. <coughs> and these variables that are right here, again, I'm, I'm glad you said that, but I wish now it really wasn't there. These two variables mean that every time you create a new book, it's going to have its own tax and its own price. Does that make sense? What she probably should have done here would have been something like, private string title, or private string ISBN, or both, all right? But that's a real good question. I, for the life of me, couldn't tell you why she did that. Is it an oversight in the book? That'd be my guess, but I don't know. All right, now we come into talking about constructors, and I already showed you them, okay? now. You, what you may or may not realize is when you call this, when you say employee followed by a name equal new employee, it actually, as it says, you're actually calling a special method called a constructor. That's on your test. You know, what's a constructor? It's a method that gets called when you instantiate an object. That's it. So anytime you instantiate an object, when you create a new object, you automatically call the constructor. If you don't write the constructor, one is written for you with no parameters. So it's just curly brace, curly brace. That's called the class's default constructor. All right? Now, notice what it says. Even though there's nothing in it, it says the automatically created constructor establishes one employee thing named a worker, but it does this for you automatically. It takes any of those fields up above that, that, that we put in there, like int, height, semicolon, or whatever, that kind of thing. It automatically sets numeric fields to zero, character fields to backslash zero. <coughs> That's called a null string. That basically is the same as the empty string, but it's the empty string for a character. And Boolean fields are set to false. And anything else is set to null. All right? So it's basically setting the default values. So if you come in here and you create, notice this, because it's diff, this is different. When you create a constructor like this, notice there's no public, there's no nothing there, okay? You cannot return a value from a constructor. It's not legal. It's not my rules, it's just not legal. So what I'm telling you is if you look back up on the screen here, because you don't have this in the example I gave you, <coughs> but in that create students, if we come back into the students file, all right, the class student and all this other good stuff, we didn't write this, but so the system wrote for us public, and I think you can still write public, student, student. The system did that for us. That's a default constructor. It doesn't do anything, all right? But if we wanted to write another Remember we talked <coughs> about overloading and you've seen how to do it? A constructor is just another method. Sometimes it's even written where they put these on the same line. Looks like that. All right. But what if I wanted to write another constructor and that constructor expected that what I wanted to be able to do is I wanted to be able to send in what? An int 
which was an ID number, all right, a string, which was a last name, and a double, which was a GPA. Okay. Now I can come in here and I can say these variables up above, ID number, the one up above, that equals ID. The name, is that what we call it here? Last name, sorry. The last name, that's equal to LN, and the grade point average is equal to GPA. You see that? Do you understand what we're doing? We are taking the same constructor and saying, now we can either create a new object and pass it in nothing, or we can create a new object and we can pass it in an, I, an ID number, all right, the, uh, a last name and a GPA. Why does that matter? I'm going to save this, and I'm going to go back to here. Now, all this stuff we did before, I'm going to comment every bit of this out, every bit of that. All right, so now it's commented out, and I'm going to now uncomment this. The other one that I showed you where we put in all that information. All right, well, you have to, if you're going to uncomment it, you've got to remove both of them. All right. So now we don't even need these. We just need those. So now when I run this, it should look exactly the same as it did before. And it does. Oh, now it took 4.1. We'll have to look at why that was the case. All right. But what I'm trying to get across to you is in the first example right here that we did, when we did it originally, we created new empty objects. So they had nothing in them. So we were able to come in and manually set the ID number manually set the last name, manually set the GPA for both of them. All right? This will still work. Notice now it's 0.0. .0. So there's something in the other one that's wrong, so we'll have to look at that. All right? But the point is, oh, I know what it is. All right? But um, in the second case, we change these. Now, since we change these, would you agree that in this second example that I just put in, where is it? Right here, since this one, yeah, yeah. Since this one right here, I'm going to get errors now because I'm defining it twice, but don't, don't let that bother you. In here, what am I not doing with a GPA? I'm not validating it. All right. Remember in here, I validated it because this is the one that got called before. Right there. Okay. So how do I get around that? Well, that, you know, I don't want an error. So how do I fix it? Well, there's different ways. But let me comment all this stuff out again so I get rid of those errors. Now, instead of saying student display, well, now I've set these. All right, I've set the first and I've set the second. I think you'd all agree with that. All right, but what I want to do, because I'm not doing any validation, I want to force there to be validation done on that. So I can come in and I can say second dot, and what you'll notice up here, it'll say last name, etc. I want to say grade point average equal, and I want to call it set, all right, not, not set, uh, second dot set, all right, I want to be able to come in there and set the GPA. I have to, I have to re write some other kind of code to do that. Or, or I have to come in here and do this. It's kind of a pain, but I can take the code that I wrote before, and I'd probably want to take this if statement and put it into its own method, all right? But if I don't want to do that, I can just copy this. And now, inside of here, instead of saying it like this, I can do this. So now I can say if, and it's not going to be value, it's going to have to be that GPA. If that GPA 
is greater than or equal to zero, and that GPA that we just passed in is less than or equal to four, accept it. Otherwise, I want to set this to lowest GPA. Okay. Now, that may have made very little sense to you, okay? but watch what happens when I run it again now. 3.5 and 0.0. .0. So sometimes when you write a constructor that has things that you get passed in, you have to do validation. If I just call the empty constructor, that calls that get set thing that we had in there before. All right. You can pass parameters in. I just showed you that. We just call that constructor. And when we call the constructor, we passed in three parameters, an int, a string, and a double. An int, a string, and a double. So the system says, okay, then you better have, you better have a constructor over there that takes an int, a string, and a double. And we do. Because if you don't, you're going to get an error message. It's just doing all this mapping to see what, you know, does this align with this type of thing? And that's what they're talking about in here. So if that confused you, just take a look at the example that they put in here. All right. This is confusing. Not, not that everything else hasn't been. But on the bottom of 384, they talk about constructor initializers. It says the employee class in the next figure has four different constructors. So if we look at the example that's right here, this looks, I don't know about you, but to me at least, this looks pretty darn confusing. All right. Well, believe it or not, the ones that you see right here, anytime it says this and it's got something there, notice with this, it's got a number and a number, all right? Here, it's got a, a name that you passed in and a number. And here, it's got two names that you passed in. Every single one of these is going to call the same routine. Right here, this constructor, we're not passing anything in. I think you'd agree with that. All right? But we use this, and we say 999, 0. So the system looks for something. It looks for another method that's got this name the name employee that requires an int and an int, an int or an int and a double or whatever. So it finds this one. So this constructor right here will call that constructor right there. If you go, that's just really confusing, then don't use it. Then don't do it. They're showing you shortcuts here. I don't know why she does this, but she does. So again, if that confuses you, forget those pages are even in the book. And don't do it that way. Notice that you can take stuff in and put it read-only. In essence, what a read-only thing does is it makes it a constant. Does that make sense to everyone? If it's read-only, you can't write to it. It's read-only. There's another one in here where they keep working with that same example and they overload the constructors. You know, maybe I'll give you some time in just a few minutes you want you can go and go through that one it starts on 387 but again it, I can't say this to you too much and it's on goes on to 388 also if you want to learn this the only way you can learn it it's like any other skill practice 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 all right it's the only way it's going to make any sense to you All right, this is, I think at least, this is a good place to stop. We're well more than halfway into this. We've got about 15 pages to go, but this is really, if, if you think, wow, this, I haven't gotten very little of this, this is worse. This overloading operators. So I'll pick it up there tomorrow. All right, and I think tomorrow we'll spend the first hour finishing this, and then we're going to go and we're going to write this person class as a class. No pun intended. All right, we're going to do that and we'll write constructors and a bunch of other stuff. And hopefully everybody will get theirs to work.
but like I said, I think that's, that's enough lecturing for today. <coughs> and if you haven't had time to, please try to look at the chapter by tomorrow.